I love the 4th of July. I have, I think it was even more uh, my favorite holiday when I was a kid than even Christmas, if you can believe that. Um, and it wasn't just the fireworks. I love the patriotism. I love our country. I, I, love, I love when I see people. Amen. Amen. I love to see people wearing red, white, and blue. I have red, white, and blue on myself today even. Isn't that cool? So um, I think maybe it's the best combination of colors of any flag out there. Would you all agree with that? It's an incredible. I think the only two colors that maybe look better side by side would be crimson and cream. Is that? <laughs> I don't know. I may get some argument with that one. I don't know. I looked right at Misty when I said that, yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I love the red, white, and blue. And we should be very thankful. Um, if I did my math right, 242 years ago, the Declaration of Independence was signed. And our land, though it had been governed unfairly, and though there was uh, much oppression, uh, pressed in taxes and laws and uh, religion and all kinds of oppression. And we threw off that oppression and we won that freedom. And we should be thankful and we should celebrate that on the 4th of July. A lot of times on the 4th of July, the message we preach is something about we ought to get back to being the nation we once were. But I'm not going to do that today. In fact, I'm really not going to talk about patriotism at all. But I do want us to understand that that freedom that we have is precious but that there is a greater freedom for us in Christ that we want to talk about today. And there's a greater celebration that we ought to have over that freedom. Because the one freedom is short-lived. It'll last only as long as you live or as long as you stay in the United States. Or as long as our government protects those freedoms. But the freedom in Christ will last for eternity. Isn't that true? So we're going to read in Acts chapter 16 a story that talks about people being liberated... A story of liberation, and we're going to kind of look at that in comparison to our salvation and what that should mean to us. We're in Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34, the story of Paul and Silas being broke out of jail or having the jail broke, but they didn't leave. This is a really cool story. Acts 16, 25 to 34, if we'll stand and applaud the reading of God's Word. After midnight, or about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But, but Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke of the, the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let's pray. Father, I would pray tonight sim or today simply that you would help me to faithfully scatter the seed of your word and that you would prepare the hearts of the listeners, myself included, to receive what you would have us to receive. And we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Be seated, please. Live free and die saved. I like that title. I, the, I was... I wish I could have come up with something that rhymed with die hard, but anyway, it worked out pretty good. Live free and die saved. That is the call of the believer in Christ. Um, if we look at verses 25 to 27, we see here uh, these men set at liberty. And I want us to notice a couple of things that it wasn't just the shackles 
that were removed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the, whatever force God sent by this earthquake and whatever other force caused these shackles to be broken. It was not just the shackles, but the doors of the very prison itself were thrown open. And I think that is significant because it reminds us that in Christ we have freedom from all things. We are, we, our liberty is, we are set at liberty from sin, from death, from self and selfishness, from all kinds of things that we would normally be encumbered by or entangled with. We are in, we are, before Christ, we are encumbered with fears about everything. We, we fear death. We fear uh, everything that, you know, the, the financial woes and all that stuff. But after Christ, we need not fear that because He has conquered things on the grave. And He chooses to take that for us so that we don't have to live in fear. We have worries uh, that, that Jesus faced on the cross. He, he faced the worries of pain and shame and ridicule and all those things that we, that we tend to worry about. Christ conquered those on the cross. And we need not fear those types of things. In uh, John chapter 8, verse 34 to 36, here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. As Christians, we need to understand that we've been purchased, we've been bought, or a freedom has been bought for us that goes beyond a simple freedom. We have, a, we have a perfect freedom that is eternal. We have a freedom that in, in, involves all parts of life. When Jesus faced sin, or when we face sin, we need to remember that Jesus faced sin and He knew no sin. When, when we face selfishness, we need to remember that Christ humbled Himself to die even on the cross. And when we face death, we need to remember that Christ conquered the grave. There is nothing that we can face in life that Christ hasn't conquered and that Christ hasn't set us at liberty from. We have all these fears and all these things that entangle us, but we need to remember that in Jesus Christ is true freedom, freedom from all things that entangle us as believers. Um, I, think about, I think about the grave and how how incredible it would have been there to sit outside the grave that day. And maybe, maybe you would have been able to be a witness of Jesus being bound in his grave clothes, you know, carried off the cross, bound in his grave clothes and set in the tomb. And, and just the, and we all know that the disciples thought it was at a permanent type of situation. But then on Sunday, I, whether Jesus rolled the stone away or the Holy Spirit rolled away or the angel, there was an angel there, maybe the angel rolled the stone away, but the stone was rolled away and Christ came forth because death could not defeat him. The greatest enemy that we have is death and Christ won the victory. So there is no, there's no enemy on this earth that we haven't been set at liberty from as believers. We have power to defeat everything that might entangle us free because He has made us free and nothing has or can ever bind Him. We are free indeed. We are also free in Deed. We're free in the things that we, we have the power to do. Before Christ, we're only free to commit sin because sin has power over us. But, but we need to understand that after Christ, we have power over sin. We, we can choose to do something different. May I say this, and not, not in a hateful way, but in a loving way, Christ did not die on the cross so that we can continue to live the way we did before Him. He died on the cross so that we might change, so that we might be different, so that we might live in the liberty that He's given us. But as Christians, we still want to struggle with those same sins we did before Jesus. There, there was a, a, a line from a, a song when I was a kid, and I've written it down here and I can't remember where I wrote it, so there you go. Uh, here we go. This song that I grew up with, it was by a Christian rock band when I was a kid. But these lyrics are so cool. And it says, Now Satan is a liar, and he wants to make us think that we are paupers. 
when he knows himself were children of the king. So lift up the mighty shield of faith, for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ is risen, so the work's already done. That's so powerful because we need to understand Satan does want us to, to, to believe that we are defeated, that we can't win the victory over sin. But yet we have a Savior who won the victory over sin and gives that victory to us through the precious blood that he shed and by winning victory over the grave when he rose from the dead. That rhymed. I could have made that into a poem. I wasn't even trying. That's pretty cool. We are free indeed. Some people take this freedom to mean that we can live the way we want to live, that we are saved, our sins are forgiven, so I can continue to do everything that I want to do without any regard for it because I know that Christ will forgive me. And we, we all, maybe some of us are in that boat, but we all, if not, we certainly know people that may even brag about that, especially in today's day, days of digital communication, right? Uh, I remember one time I was getting ready to, to preach, and I found out that one of the people that worked with our youth at the church that we were at um, had was bragging on Facebook about a party that they went to the night before and had pictures of then them drinking and and you know and I and it made me so mad and let me, let me you're not supposed to preach mad right God doesn't want you to preach mad but that day I preached mad and I had to repent later but here's the problem with that is we have people that want to live like that like it's okay to live however you want because God's got your back listen God does have your back but He's not purchased your freedom so that you would fall back into slavery to sin. He's purchased your freedom so that you might live like children of God. There's a passage that Paul talks about this very thing. And I think they were kind of coming at it from a little bit different standpoint. They did want that freedom to sin and they wanted an excuse to be able to sin. So they said, well, listen, if God's grace is so good... Why don't we just continue to sin? And the more we sin, the more people will see how great God's grace is, right? If He can, if he can forgive my little lies, then, then certainly He can forgive my adultery. And, and God will see that, and he'll be, or the people will see that, and they'll be glorified because God's grace is so big that it can forgive even the most ungodly person. And here's Paul's response to that. And I think it's very powerful. We're going to read a little bit. So turn with me to Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. I thought about just picking and choosing a few verses out of this passage, but um, decided we needed to read all of it. And you'll see in verse 1 that the response to this question that he's been asked, Romans 6, starting in verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And then Paul's answer, by no means. And by the way, there's a double negative there in Greek, and it's not like in English they don't offset each other. It's like he's saying, no way. Don't let that ever be the case. Let me tell you as, as most strongly as I can, no, that's not the right attitude. So verse 2, no how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism and the death in order that Jesus, or just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Doesn't that sound like just like the baptism little thing that we say, buried in His likeness, raised to walk in newness of life? We were buried. We were killed. Our old selves are dead but we live a new life in Christ. We have a freedom now in Christ. We're not tied to sin. And I lost where I was. Verse 5, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Let me read that one again. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Such a powerful passage. But we need to live like that. We need to live like children of the King. We need to live like who we are. We are sons and daughters of God, the Creator, the Holy One. Don't stay stuck in your sin-filled life. Listen to the language of that that passage as we kind of look through it again. He talks about newness of life. He talks about the old self being crucified. He talks about sin being brought to nothing. He talks about being set free from sin. He talks about living with Christ. He talks about being dead to sin and alive to God. Freedom is victory over sin. It's victory over ourselves. The, the, the speaker this week at camp did a wonderful job of helping us understand that, I'm sorry, last week, did a wonderful job of helping the kids understand that we want to live for ourselves, but we have to give that up and give God control of everything, of everything. Victory over self, victory over death, victory over every enemy, because the greatest enemies have already been defeated. Death, sin, and Satan have all been defeated by our great and powerful Savior, by the way, Christian, um, Satan is a powerful being. But let me say this. He has no power in your life unless you give it to him. Because he's been defeated. Christ lives in you. You have the power over Satan because you have the power of Christ in you. So the only power Satan has over you is when you give it. And how do you give him power? And I can say this a hundred times, but unless we hear it, it doesn't do any good. If you get out of the Word of God, if you get out of the fellowship of His people, if you get away from spending time with God in any way, shape, or form, sin and temptation are going to beat you every time. Because you've opened the door. You've let Satan have a foothold. But if we stay prepared, if we keep our armor on, right, we have greater power to defeat Satan. He has no power in your life unless you give it to him. Um, I think I'm getting out of order on my message here, so we're just going to go wherever we go, right? Here's, what I, here's the way I look at this. If you're going to work on a car, uh, there are several ways you can try to work on it. You can work on it without any tools, and you're not going to be very successful. You can work on it without tool or with the wrong tools. I can use a hacksaw to change the oil, and I probably succeed in getting the oil out, but I doubt I succeed in getting any oil back in with a hacksaw, right? So as Christians, here's what we do. We go through life and we either decide to turn away God's tools. God's given us all the tools to defeat the devil. And we say, God, I think I can do this without your tools. I don't need your word. I don't need prayer. I don't need to be in church. I don't need the fellowship of God's people. I don't need any of that. I'm strong enough on my own. And then we fail and we go, God, where were you? <laughs> and God says, uh, here's my tools. I gave you this toolbox. It's even wrapped nice and it's got everything in it you need. Or we use the wrong tools. We get wisdom from the Internet. We get wisdom from books that d deny the power and the truth of the Word of God. And we still want to complain, God, what happened? Why did, why did my marriage fail? Why am I in this much trouble? Why am I on my way to jail, right? And we, we do all this stuff, and God wants to say, look, I've given you the tools, and I've given you the right tools, and you've turned them down. Folks, we have such a power in Christ. He has won the victory and He's there on our side. And all we need to do is use what He's given us to use. We have freedom in deed. Or in deeds would probably would have been a better way to say that, wouldn't it? So it wouldn't be confusing. We, have, we are free in deed. 
We're free in, in every way. We're free in deeds. We're free to do what needs to be done and what Christ has uh, purchased us to do. And then thirdly, we are free in Christ. And uh, look at this, those last little bit there. Then they brought, verse 30, then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what do I must do? What must I do to be saved? This is the, the guard talking. And Paul answers simply, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. We are free in Christ. We are freely saved. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave us His Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 10, 9 and 10, For if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, excuse me, just verse 9, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you catch how simple that is? If you believe and confess, you will be saved. We have freely been given salvation if we only take it. If we only take it. We've been given obedience through freedom, you notice that immediately they obeyed in baptism and then they began to celebrate their decision. And then lastly, I want us to see that we are freely yoked in Christ to the one who is victorious. I love this passage and I will probably preach from it a million times in half a million weeks. I mean, I love it that much. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. I don't know how many years would it take to get to a million weeks, but that's how long I'm going to live. You guys will probably fire me before then. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. This is how you gain freedom. If you are here today and you don't know Christ, let me tell you, this is how you gain freedom over sin and death and worry and fret and all the things that you're battled by. If you are in Christ today and you've begun to lose some battles, this is how you begin to win those battles again. It's very simple. Christ tells us, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so here's the thing. Jesus is talking to these people, and they've been beat up, and they're defeated, and they don't know what victory is. And Christ says, if you, if you feel that way, then you can come to me. If you're, if you're someone today and you don't know Christ, and you want to know what true victory, what true freedom in Christ looks like, you can come to Him today, and you will have victory. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you, and you feel like you're, you, you've been beat up a little bit because you've just kind of gotten away from God a little bit, I want you to know that you can come back and you will have victory. But how do you do it? Come to me, you are who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And here's the secret. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Instead of carrying your own burdens, you say to Jesus, I want your burdens, Jesus. What's Jesus' burdens? Well, his burden was going to the cross, but he's already done that. His burden was living a perfect life, and he's already done that. His burden was to go to die and then to conquer death, and he's already done that. So what burden are you taking? You're not taking much of a burden at all. What he's saying simply is this. If you will let me be the Lord of your life, if you'll give up the stuff that you want to control and you'll let me control it, I will give you rest and freedom and victory and you will live like sons of God instead of like paupers. Amen? So if you're here today and God is dealing with you, you don't, you don't have to come talk to me if you're embarrassed about that. But these altars up here, well, they're kind of altars. These altars up here are for you to commit to God what He's laid on your heart to commit to Him. And you're free to do that. If you want to visit with me about salvation, how, how can I have this victory you're talking about, Brian? If you want to visit with me about struggles and just let me pray with you, that's what I'm there for. And as we play the music, you come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for victory. We thank you for true freedom. 
that is above and beyond anything we celebrate on the 4th. Father, we thank you that we know that freedom here today, that, um, that we understand that we've been bought and that we have strength and power to conquer Satan. And Father, if there's anybody here who doesn't understand that in their heart, then I pray that you would speak to them and that they would respond this day. And we pray these things in your holy name. Amen.